from a very similar thing, just like that. How are you doing today? And somebody said, living the dream. And I thought, what in the world does that really mean? So doing a little research, I found out there was a song on it. Kind of interesting. Then I found out there was a series on TV about it. Rather less interesting. But then it really came back to, what does living the dream mean? And a lot of times people will say that or don't change a little bit and say, living someone else's dream or living in some dream, or living a nightmare, but it always comes off that basis of living a dream. So what are we talking about when we say we're living a dream? Whose dream is it we're living? Um, I know that I have a dream for my son, and he ain't living it. But he's living a dream that he has, maybe. But when we talk about spirituality, and here in Psalm 126, they're talking about a dream that they have. It says, when the Lord brought back the captives of Zion, we were like those who dream. And it really got me thinking about all the dream opportunities through the Bible. And we've got some back there. I mean, there's another Old Testament, something about seeing things and going from a dungeon and all that. We may cover that one, but I doubt it. There's a lot more dreams that we don't ever touch in the Bible. And this one really came out with me. What dream are they talking about here in Psalm 126? It says, when the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. And what they're thinking about is they're talking about coming out of captivity. So they've been in exile for 70 years. And miraculously, in God's plan, they are suddenly released and allowed to turn home. And they are full of joy. And that's the living the dream that they had. The dream was for them to be back in their homeland. They wanted to return out of captivity. Now, Israel has done this more than once, haven't they? And they're doing it again. Are they facing struggles today? Yes. But they still have that dream, that promise that was made to Abraham. And they're trying to live out that dream. So when he says it in these verses, they're talking about the joy they have. And it really got me thinking about what joys do we have as Christians? So one of the first joys we come across would be salvation, yes? We can all agree that that brought a tremendous joy to us. Uh, and it probably is more closer to the same thing they're feeling because we were in darkness. And all of a sudden, the light comes on. And we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And things change for us. There's an immense joy in our hearts. There, there's a new brightness to our days. Something changes us. And it's the closest thing we can come to to what they're feeling here of being in bondage and being allowed to go home almost immediately. But after that joy of salvation, does it last? Are you still in the same point of euphoria as that moment you were saved? No. Nope. We're not. We lose that joy, don't we? And, and that's to be expected. Because we go through the battles and the struggles because we're still a sinful creature. So we're still going to experience those downs away from that joy of salvation. But because we've had that joy of salvation, we can also turn around into another joy. And that's the joy of having spiritual victories. Don't we have an ultimate spiritual victory over Satan? Yeah. But we also have spiritual victories in our own lives right now. We come across those things because once we have that new uh, wine skin, that new clothing on us, that new heart, that new desire and passion, we want to remove sin from our lives. And because we have that clearance now, we have that desire, when we overcome something that has been of a sinful nature or a tripping point for us, we can still feel that joy, that spiritual victory. Will it be fleeting again? Yes. Because there's going to be another one take its place that we have to try and get rid of. We recognize that as Christians on our daily walk. There's always something we can do better to serve Christ. But we have the joy of salvation with the joy of spiritual victory. So those are the two biggest ones we might have. But then there's also the joy of Christian fellowship. Now, did we miss that in the past year? Yeah. It was hard not being able to come together, wasn't it? Uh, it's hard not seeing our fellow believers, our fellow worshipers, those that we sharpen iron to iron. We need that relationship. 
And sometimes through no fault of our own, like the pandemic, or moving because of our job, or leaving because of school, or maybe someone passes away, that fellowship with those Christians changes. That dynamic changes. And we go through the same time. Sometimes it is a sin. And sometimes sin from one or another causes a divide between brothers and sisters in Christ. I've seen sins rip churches apart. We've all heard of those. We've seen them. So that joy of Christian fellowship is another joy that we get all the time. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to come together to worship and praise God. Not just to sharpen iron and hear his word. Not just to praise him and to thank him and give offerings to him. But to be with one another. To encourage one another. To lift somebody up when they need that joy. How many times have we come to church and we've seen somebody that you know is just down? They're just not having a great day. And you think about the same time when you come to church that way. And we may try and hide it as best we can, but those of us who know us, who are truly in that Christian fellowship with us, they recognize it. And they come over and they nudge you with the elbow a little bit. They try and get you to come out to talk, to get back in that joy that they've had in salvation, that joy of spiritual victory, that joy of Christian fellowship. All those things are in there. And what they're trying to talk to us here in this verse is trying to get the whole meaning of it. We have to have joy if we're following Christ. And we can look to the ultimate joy of a new heaven and a new earth. And that's something to keep our eyes focused on. But day to day, we're always going to have the ebbs and the flows. We're always going to have the ups and the downs. So what he's getting through here is he says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, back in verse 25, so the Lord surrounds his people. That's the ultimate joy, is spending time with God. I was sitting last night in our new home. My wife bought me a new home. It's got wheels on it. It's a nice camper, and I took it to camp. And I'm looking out the window to the west. It's just a beautiful sunset. And it's not a picture I get out of our home right now. Because if I look out of a west window in our brick and mortar house, I see another house. But to look out and to be going through God's word and just see a beautiful sunset and his creation of nature and all the greenness from all the rain and realize that God is still on the throne. And how easy it is for us to lose sight of that when we bury our head in day-to-day -day obligations in the chores of life get to have communion with God. So that's a joy that's always there for us. So they're going back and looking at this from 125. The Psalm 126 is in a series of 15 here. It's the seventh one. So these all run together and tie in. But what he's talking about is that same joy coming back to them. And you get to the second half, the second stanza, it says, Restore our captivity, O Lord. Wait a minute. We're in a joyous state because we're going from exile back to our home, and now you're saying, put us back in captivity. Why in the world would he say that? Does that make any sense at all? You have to remember this is a poem, and a huge contrast is what makes poems great. Yeah, and this, sense to this world. do what? Does it wouldn't make any sense to this world? Uh, not in today's world a whole lot, no. But that poetry is still there. It's coming from the great joy. We are glad the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. And then restore our captivity, O Lord. As the streams in the south. What's south of where they're at? The great desert. So think about the rain that we've had. Uh, when I was at camp three weeks ago, we had rains. From about 2 a.m., because from the first lightning strike hit, until about 8 o'clock. And we have a low water crossing in the middle of camp. And it went from below the crossing to doubling every hour. We went 6, 12, 24, 36, and then it stopped at 42 feet in six hours. And where we were, and it was just maybe. I don't think it's 15 miles wide according to the radar. We got 6.8 inches of rain on top of us and in our floodplain right above us. That's a lot of rain. And it quickly filled 
up our low water crossing to the brink. So much so that right down the road, they actually had to come and save somebody and try to drive through it across the road. He's talked about the same thing in the deserts. Deserts are beautiful. I love the West Texas breaks. Beautiful place. They're dry. The mesquite trees, you can see over all of them. There's no such thing as a tall tree out there. But those breaks just roll. And the cactus live out there. But when it rains, those breaks become quick waterways. And what he's saying here in the second half is, as the streams in the south. He's talking about a flash flood of joy. He's saying, God, we've been in the desert. We've been in that exile. We know what it's like to thirst for you, to long for you, to be back home where you've intended us to be. We recognize that our sins put us into exile. But immediately your rain comes and heals us. And immediately what was dry becomes full of water and life. We say it just like that desert in the flash flood. You've come back to us, God. How many times have we gone through in our own sin and removed ourselves from God? Because, well, God's not with me. It's not because God's not with you. It's just because you're walking away instead of turning and walking towards him. And what they're saying is God's always been there. We just have to turn around and immediately see him again. But it's so easy that when things aren't going our way to take our eyes off of God and focus on the problems instead of the solution. And when we forget that our creator God is over all things, we have a sense to try and solve those problems ourselves, don't we? Try and do them in our own powers, in our own dreams, in our own visions, instead of following God's plan. So the first part of this talk about how immediately God comes to us, just like our salvation. Did you do anything to get saved except say yes? It was all in God's plan, wasn't it? He opened your heart. He had people plant seeds in your life. He came along and had other people water drops. It may have taken a long time for you, or it may have been the first time you ever heard God's word. But the thing is, when you said yes, everything changed in an instant. That flash flood occurred in your heart. The second part of the second stanza says a little differently. It says, those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves. So we've had the second stanza start with an immediate flash flood of joy, but now it slows down. It says there's going to be toil, there's going to be labor, and there's going to be hard work. There's going to be weeping. That's the greatest problem we have in some of our churches right now and in most of our Christian lives. There's not enough weeping to reach others. There's not enough passion in our heart. We got so caught up in the joy that we've had in trying to find it again that we're not willing to share it with others. And I can tell you now that the greatest joy is when someone comes to Christ because of what you've done. I can remember taking groups to Falls Creek and I was so pleased when they started letting the youth actually be the counselors. Because it teaches them at an early age how to help guide someone through Christ. And one time we were down there, and um, he came, the young man came to me after the end. He goes, wow, this is incredible. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I feel better now after leading them to salvation than I did when I got saved. That doesn't make any sense. something there because your passion was great enough for you to volunteer and here you are coming to Falls Creek which is not just a time of volleyball tournaments and going down to the tabernacle and, and ice skates afterwards but you took on the responsibility as a teen to go and do some extra training to be a counselor because God put a passion in your heart and he saw that come to fruition in that first time so there's going to be times when there's toil. There's going to be times when the seeds aren't going to fall. Of course, this takes us into Matthew 13, doesn't it? With the sower and the seeds and falling up, some of it being taken by birds immediately, some of it falling on shallow ground, being burned up, 
others having a great start, but they get choked out by thorns. And then finally, there's a poor seed that manages to grow and produce fruit. So it is with our walks. We always have to be about sowing those seeds. Because in the end of it, chapter 26 here tells us that we will have joy and we will bring in our sheaves. The harvest that we have from the seed that we've sown for Jesus Christ, that will be the greatest joy we ever have. And even now, when we talk about the joy of salvation disappearing, the joy of spiritual victory disappearing, the joy of Christian fellowship disappearing, the joy even of bringing someone else to Christ will disappear. But there will be a time when dry eyes, every tear will be wiped away and there will be a joy everlasting in heaven. And what's going to make that joy so great is the wheat that we bring in as Christians. I'm going to carry more on that on Sunday morning about the weeping and the sowing and what it means. But I want you to realize as you go through that the next time someone says to you, hey, how are you doing? you hear someone and they respond with that to you. Living a dream. Really? What a dream are you living? Because when that happens, God's just opened up a huge door for you. And don't just politely ask if you can come in. Kick that sucker open and plant some seeds. Because you're going to reap joy because of it. It's not always easy, is it? It's even harder when we try and plant those seeds with family members or close friends. But I think we'd be a lot happier to know that they're in our sheaves and in our fellowship and they have the same joy of salvation and the same joy of spiritual victory over what's been bothering them than to be looking at them across that gulf for eternity and wondering why didn't I just that could be Lord, we thank you so much. Before we were even born, you knew the plan. And you brought up people, and they experienced salvation. And they listened to you. And even as they fought their own trials and their own tribulations, they found that through their spiritual victories, they became closer to you. And that longing for others to have that same fellowship with you choked at their hearts. And as a result, they planted seeds in our lives. Some as Sunday school teachers, some as music leaders, some as chaperones at camps, some as just friends at break time. Father, every one of us was touched by the Holy Spirit. And we found that joy and salvation. And we felt that joy in overcoming sins in our lives. And Father, we know that there's still more sins, more things that we could do better for you. Father, we look forward to the next spiritual victory that you're going to give us over those problems. Father, we thank you for the joy of Christian fellowship that you give us. And Father, even though there are some that are still not out and about, we still are with them and they with us, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we know that although they're saved, Father, there's so much more to living now. And we should have life and have it to its fullest amount here on earth. But that means living for you. That means reaching for you. That means sowing seeds for you. So, Father, I pray now that as we go through the rest of this week, as we prepare for worship on Sunday, that, Father, you will just throw those doors before us. That we'll see those souls who need encouraging words. And Father, that the seeds, that the words from your Bible will just pour forth from our lips. And Father, that can only happen when our cup runs over. When we're involved with you in our prayer time and our own personal journey. So Father, I pray that you'll find before us all those opportunities and those times to get closer to you. Not just to become content with where you have us, but also to become discontent with our efforts of saving others. Embolden us, empower us, 